the other day my husband said to me that um, people don't often calculate what it actually means to live out your mandate in fullness what it looks like when you go to the streets because your experiences on the ground can actually wear you out they can cause you to pause they can even cause you to shrink back from the purpose that you're actually meant to be living out there is a price that has to be paid there is a sacrifice to be made but when we actually engage ourselves and make the sacrifice the impact that our lives can have on just one person or on an entire community of people is monumental. Today, we're speaking to John Mills Jaroge, one man who has made up his mind that he's going to focus on transforming the hearts and the minds of young men and of families in Kenya and in Africa in order to bring about a change that is genuinely transformative and genuinely from the root of the community, not superficial. So. Join us after this to hear more what he has to say. Thank you so much, John, for joining us, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to spend time with you today. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. Oh, we're really grateful. Um, please, uh, could you tell our audience um, about yourself, about your background, and your experience in training? Oh, great. Uh, my name is John Wills uh, Jeroge, uh, managed to Jerry Jeroge. And uh, my background in training, um, I started uh, actually. I started with the seeking to understand what the kingdom looks like, and that's that's why I ended up in a seminary. <laughs> which uh, and the only lecture I had about the kingdom was um, by a certain lady who was fired after that semester mm -hmm. uh, because um, I think she knew her thing, and uh, I, I don't know what happened. Then after that, I did um, international relations and security studies mm -hmm. just to understand. Uh, uh, global politics and how they affect domestic uh, politics, mm -hmm. uh, international political economy and security, um, understanding uh, Africa, mm -hmm. Africa's role in the global affairs. Uh, then I've, I combined that with psychology, uh, how people behave. Actually, I really wanted to uh, take anthropology, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think I will. I, 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 I think <laughs> yeah, I will. Done it. Yes, yes, yes. But the most important thing for me is um, to understand how people behave and how the world functions mm -hmm. outside the box. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, if I can just go there a little bit, what is your fascination with the way things work, and then why exactly are you so interested in how things work and how they interact? I, I think that for me, the most important thing is. Uh, getting people um, to look at the boxes that they are in. You know, they, like that thing of thinking outside the box. And sometimes I find it hard because um, the only way to think outside the box uh, for them is uh, embracing the box that they are in. Right. Uh, so what I find um, fascinating for me is someone who actually gets to a point where they are able to articulate their vision and their mission in life outside um, our social addictions mm -hmm. that actually restrict our societies yeah. and, uh, and families. So when, when a young person comes and asks me, uh, what do you think I should do? Uh, my, my question to that person is, what, what are you here for? Uh, because if you're able to answer that question, mm -hmm. then you will not be seeking to know what you need to do from other people. Right. Because everything is in you uh, mm -hmm. by design. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. I completely agree with you. Now, um, having known you for a few years, I know you have a very serious passion for transforming young men's hearts and impacting them in a really positive way. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about that and, and the why behind it? Actually, uh, it, it's the, the drive is an empowered and dignified continent. 
a story that was born uh, through my experiences uh, in life. Uh, by uh, and, and I have, I, I would say, three players in that story. Uh, one is an elderly lady, and then two men. Mm -hmm. So uh, the two men, one of them is my former high school principal, uh, who got to know that I didn't have a father, and he became a father. Mm -hmm. So he told me, anything you need, just let me know. I am here for you. Now that story came from a situation where I was involved in a strike, and uh, in school, and I was among the students who uh, <laughs> who led the strike. And so he called me and said, "You know, if I kick you out of this space, that's it. And there's no way I'm going to expel you. If you can convince this number of students to go home, then I think you're a resource." So we worked together. After high school, I was heartbroken because that was a transition of separation from my father. Mm -hmm. um, and then one time I went, uh, I was in a meeting somewhere. Uh, it, there's, there are these people who are, they, they were actually praying for the country. Mm -hmm. um, so after the prayer meeting, this man walks uh, and he says, uh, uh, I, I think God is asking me to be your father figure. Wow. And, and so I told him, no, uh, I don't take those things of God said. Yeah. Uh, it's okay, you can be my friend. <laughs> so, um, the funny thing is that um, he was consistent and he worked with me, uh, even paid my dowry when I was getting married. Wow. And he's a, he's a stranger. But that person is an elderly lady who taught me a lot. Um, and uh, she used to run a shop. I call her Shushu because I lived in their family. Mm -hmm. And uh, she used to run a shop. Uh, and she also used to cook for the guys who were involved in construction around that place. And by the end of the day, every evening she used to invite children. And these kids would take whatever is in that show. And one time I asked her, how do you, how, how does this business make sense? And she said, no, it's not about this business making sense. It's about dignifying people. So there is no way this child can go home hungry when I have food here. So she used to give a lot. And when she was dying, uh, she's one lady who died empty, uh, wow. I must say, yeah. Because she gave everything, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of these stories are, like, they have foundational impact. Absolutely. Not just even for you, but now, even through your life, to the lives of others. True, true, true. And, and, and I think for uh, one of the things I that, that has helped me a lot is uh, the nuggets of wisdom that I received from these young people. One uh, from my former high school principal when I was leaving, because from Form 2 to Form 4, I was a senior captain and I was never punished. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, there's one thing I want you to remember in life, that um, humility is the most important thing. And uh, how he did that, he called me and said, I just want you to give me a chance to spank you. <laughs> I said, no, H how do you spank me? As in, there's nothing I have done. No, 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 I'll tell you why. <laughs> so, <laughs> so allow me to spank you, then I, I can tell you why. I said, no. He asked me, do you trust me? I said, yes, I do. Then allow me to spank you. I said, no. So I just agreed and uh, he spanked me. Then he said, you know, when you go out there, always remember that. Uh, a little bit that you felt is a uh, is is a reminder mm -hmm. that uh, you're a product of this community and uh, you're not a self-made man. Mm -hmm. Then uh, these are the gentlemen. Uh, for him, there's nothing big. I think there's nothing overwhelming for him because he believes that um, that God is present. He believes that uh, we are here for a purpose, and he also taught me that. Um, Money is not everything. Human capital is the most important thing. And he actually avoids human capital. He says, don't be isolated. Oh, wow. Yeah. So make sure that you have human connection. Um, and uh, for, this, uh, for this lady, she said, uh, give the best you can in this society. And so as a result of that, for the work that I do, um, Anything that, uh, that I am involved in, mm -hmm. it's to empower, to dignify. 
and empowering involves uh, communicating by giving knowledge, then uh, enlightening uh, the hearts of people, and allowing these people to be involved, uh, engaged in what they are in, in what you in what you're doing. Simply creating a web in the society uh, where people can hold each other and rise up in. That's beautiful. Sorry, I just I mean I love it because um, oftentimes, no, actually more and more increasingly in society, what's happening is that people are being taught how to be isolated. So do you find it challenging to bring people together? Are they responsive to the ideas and the suggestions that you make when you go out and reach out to them? I would say actually that um, it is working, um, but. I find it working more uh, among the broken, uh, and uh, this because when when I am working with people uh, in the informal settlements, uh, for them they, they have human connection. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm working with people in prison, they have human connection. These are people who have reached this space where they are saying that uh, I am grateful this thing happened because I met myself. Uh, and I'm not in any way advocating poverty and, uh, a, and, and, and pain and all those things. Uh, but I think these are people who have reached a place where they are not addicted to individualism. Uh, they, they, actually, they have actually moved away from isolation. Uh, and even though some of them are facing depression, anxiety, you know, and such things, they have someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, that actually helps us intensify uh, our support, especially for uh, for such for such groups. I remember there is this, this one time because I also volunteer in hospitals. Um, I remember there is this one time I, I was in uh, in a private hospital, and and someone uh, one of my colleagues uh, said, "You know, here you will have a hard time because when you're helping uh, the middle class." Uh, they will be asking you about your qualifications. Um, <laughs> but uh, when you're helping people in a public hospital, they are willing to receive mm -hmm. uh, because that's the best uh, they, they, can, they can get as a result of their uh, social and economic uh, situations mm -hmm. and circumstances, I would put it that way. So there's a lot of isolation in our society. And how is this isolation um, built? It's uh, simply by us moving our identity from who we are to the things that we have. Mm -hmm. So by by doing so, we are building walls. Um, uh, by doing so, people will interact with you based on what uh, on what you do yeah. uh, or where you work, not necessarily because you are a human being. Mm -hmm. And so our drive here is to help people remember that they are human beings yeah. and they can connect and support each other. Yeah. That's true. Um, so you work a lot with, with young men. Yes. Um, could you tell us why and what kind of work you do with them? Um, thank you. I, I think one of the things is that I grew up without a father. Then there are these two men who uh, in, intervened. Uh, then the other thing is that uh, while working with people in, um, in prisons, like currently uh, there's some work I'm doing and I realize that uh, we have 14% of ladies in prison mm -hmm. uh, compared to 85% of men young men okay. and these are teenagers yeah. and so my question is why do we have young men uh, in, in prison uh, when you look at uh, the statistics uh, especially for um, the people who are dying uh, in, in, in our society uh, talk of uh, a crime uh, related situations uh, you think about uh, traffic yeah, like now border borders and all that, most of them are men. And as a result of that, uh, I find that we need to do something about men. Then number two, that is intervention and rescue. Then number two, when you think about uh, um, a gender equality, uh, abuse among women, perpetrators are men. So if we want to make sure that children and women are safe, then we need to equip these men. Mm -hmm. And equipping this man is mainly helping the man know his identity, uh, helping the man articulate his vision, um, helping the man know that uh, um, that he has something, uh, 
that he carries as, uh, as a man. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also this one situation where, you, you know, I hear people saying that uh, women are their own enemies. Uh, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't believe so, <laughs> because I think for men it's bad. Uh, uh, 2017, uh, I come, my my cons constituency, uh, there, there are some cops who are deployed to come and calm the situation. Mm -hmm. So this one day I decided to go to a police station, um, and uh, I carried uh, a manual, father to son, mm -hmm. and so I found, uh, a, the, the OCPD and the OCS are deploying uh, the, the cops uh, and so I decided to, to have a conversation with them before they, they did and I remember one cop saying uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, if, uh, if they throw stones uh, we shoot or something like that and, and I told him man what if it's your son throwing that stone would you would you shoot him yeah said uh, we don't think about such things when you're going on a mission and I asked him does that make you uh, a human being or why can't you look for other ways to engage these people mm -hmm. and it really helped yeah. because uh, the OCPD then was uh, accepted the call because we had a conversation with him on how uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to to engage uh, with, the, with the communities so one way, the reason why we would get involved in such situations is to make sure that we don't have young men dying. Mm -hmm. uh, we can actually have a conversation. And as a society, one of the things I have found is that um, we don't look at conflict as a presenting opportunity to make our society better. Mm -hmm. So we try to, uh, we, tr we try to, when we go to religious groups, we pray away uh, conflict. When we come to governance, we invite law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we are trying to contain is this pain in the society instead of having a conversation. Right. So my goal uh, when engaging with such groups is mainly to address community trauma, uh, whereby people can, ex can express their pain and then we can get to a place where we understand each other yeah. and we can grow together. Yeah. Because by the end of the day, and that's what I was uh, telling the OCPD with the new reforms in the police force. It means that this person will come and work in this station, but after that, he will have to go and live in a community. Mm -hmm. So what kind of community is he to live in here? Yeah, yeah, what well, fruit will we find because the seeds that have been sown. Absolutely. So father to son is one of your, one of your yes, yes. done? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this uh, father to son and um, it has been uh, it has been an interesting journey. Just having fathers uh, embrace this journey, yeah. um, where they mentor their sons, and uh, for the fathers, uh, for biological fathers who are present when they bring their sons for mentorship, sometimes I say no. I'd rather work with the father for him to mentor the son, yes. because their relationship is long term. Right. Does it make business sense? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> <You're finishing laughs> <the point. laughs> yes, uh, but uh, but the good thing is uh, going back to the old lady. Mm -hmm. She told me um, when you uh, when you work it out in a way that you support people, you will never lack. Yes. And uh, and and he she used to to pray for me, and for sure, uh, I, I have never lacked. Yeah. yeah, because it makes life sense. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, if what you're actually doing is giving fathers the tools they never had Absolutely. to be fathers to their sons, Absolutely. then what you're doing is actually rebuilding an entire society. True, true. And the ripple effects are far greater than you having 30 mentorship, mentorship sessions. True, true, true. You know, with young men. And, and, uh, and, and um, I find it interesting because uh, there's, a, there's a father, we had a conversation with him and he had brought his son and I told him, uh, you know, your son is not that he needs to be mentored by another man. Right? All he needs is your attention yeah. and he needs to connect with you as a father. And so we had an assessment for the father and then for the son and um, the father got to know that he is not present. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is one father I truly celebrate because uh, the following week he, he resigned 
Right. Yeah, from his uh, from his workplace, and he said, you know, uh, there is no way I can present a broken child to the world uh, when when I am making a lot of money here. So he had to reduce on his uh, what you'd say comfort yeah. uh, to make sure that he builds a son. For what does he profit a man? <laughs> yes. So, so that's the, yeah. Then uh, there's this one time we had a conversation in a, in a village somewhere uh, with a group of old men. I think in total uh, they were about they were about uh, fourteen, twelve, fourteen men, or elderly men, and <laughs> and in total we were joking with my wife. In total their age, uh, I think it was almost. Um, is it 400 or 400 and something? <laughs> <laughs> and, and my wife was just telling me, no, that's huge. So this group, um, after a father to son session, mm -hmm. they, I found that they were, they were sad. Then uh, by the end of the day, uh, as I was going home, an elderly lady uh, in a marketplace somewhere came running and he asked me, are you John, uh, who was tra training our men here at CTS? So she gave me 200 shillings. And she said, just accept this as my gift because you have brought my, my husband back home. What? They had separated. And it's not separation where uh, they were in different homes. No, they were in the same house, but living in different rooms. Wow. Yeah. So um, I have seen... Uh, I, I must say that uh, with God's help, I, I have seen the families uh, transform, and it is possible. It is possible. Yeah, it is possible for yeah. people to reconcile and to be together. Please tell us about brave hearts. Uh, brave hearts. Um, brave. Yes, brave hearts. Uh, a leadership journey, leaving no son behind. Um, this one uh, is a manual to assist uh, boys uh, in. Uh, especially teenagers, one to to know their purpose in life uh, by articulating their vision, and uh, the other thing is that um, to help them also know where they are at um, in their developmental stages. Mm -hmm. Now, the purpose of Brave Hearts is to create a community of young men uh, who are driven by conviction mm -hmm. and uh, who are driven by truth and care the society uh, a community of young men uh, who truly love truth uh, and by so doing uh, they excel uh, economically uh, socially uh, they, they also excel as, uh, as, a, as a society and uh, also as a way of uh, mitigating uh, bullying uh, in, in schools mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things is that uh, Bullies are cowards. So what you're trying to do with Brave Hearts is to build courage among boys uh, to know actually they can uh, stand for truth. Yeah. And last week, uh, there's a boy, eight year old, who went home and told the mom, uh, I just dropped a bully uh, in, in school. And I was very happy. Uh, that day is where you say that today I will sleep in my shoes. <laughs> 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 just to celebrate the, <laughs> to celebrate the young man. So everything is possible. And now uh, with Brave Hearts, it's actually connecting uh, our society, our social uh, uh, well-being with our governance mm -hmm. uh, and encouraging these young men to participate in um, uh, leadership and governance. And it's not necessarily occupying a space somewhere or having an office somewhere as, as an MC, a senator or something like that, but making sure in your home in your village, in your community, there is truth, there is justice, and there is healing taking place. Because if you do so, no matter what people say and do, uh, everything will be okay for your for your society. Oh my God, that's just thank you. Um, I want to talk about um, one group in society that I find. Huh, I don't know if marginal is, is the right word considering that they actually have a large amount of wealth. But 
I just find that even socially speaking, um, the middle class are a group of people that seem to be more lost than ever. Even in the middle of having a, a certain type of abundance. They have resources, they have homes, their children have clothes and food, they're going to school. But there is an isolation that is happening in that group um, that um, keeps them living a fake life even when they have pain and also not participating in society and, com you know, like, uh, what is the word, contributing to society in a way that can actually be positively transformative. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going on with the middle class and how do we reach them with programs like these and restore them to a place of accuracy? Because I think they can have a huge amount of impact. Um, I, I think I, I would respond with a, a question. Mm -hmm. um, a, who are these people who, who isolates? Yeah. Uh, someone who isolates is someone who is traumatized. And so how the middle class and how our society is behaving today, it is a result of uh, social trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, there's individual trauma and there's collective trauma. And uh, collective trauma, we have injustices, we have corruption, we have all those things. Individual trauma, what is happening at home, uh, you find that um, there's, there's a lot of uh, emotional abuse, uh, there's financial abuse where uh, we control each other based on how much I earn, how much you earn. And then uh, the other thing is uh, our definition of success. Um, so um, how I define success is maybe the car that I drive, uh, maybe the place where I live, uh, maybe the work that I do. And um, a good example is uh, is uh, I, I, in, in, this, uh, in this community where a child is misbehaving. And uh, then there's intervention uh, from, let's say, uh, the neighbors in that society. Mm -hmm. And then when with this intervention uh, is actually disregarded and presented by someone who says, you don't, you can't even afford where I take my child to school. Mm -hmm. But you see, you know, that's not what we are discussing here. Mm -hmm. We are discussing about a human being, but you're still attaching this child's identity to an institution. That institution can come to an end any time, mm -hmm. but what will remain? Yeah. So I, I think for the, for the middle class, one is to address trauma. Uh, and then number two, to realize that um, true satisfaction is not in an institution. True satis satisfaction is not um, in, uh, in, in how much you how much you earn, or even the car that you drive, or even the school that you go to, and all that. Uh, all those things actually, they contribute to, uh, let's say, your worldview. Mm -hmm. And so the best way is first, bring a sense of healing. And that is where uh, I think I would say, our conversations as, also, as a society should not actually start from our economic empowerment. They should actually start from addressing collective trauma. Mm -hmm. and addressing individual trauma uh, as a people. Why do we have people uh, insulting each other in, in organizations? Mm -hmm. uh, why do we have people bringing down each other in, a, in a, an organization? It's simply because of trauma. And so where there is pain, people tend to isolate. Yeah. Uh, where there is injustice, people tend to isolate. And what trauma does, it drives someone to a place of feeling helpless. Mm -hmm. And so we learn how to be helpless. And so I can only do with bare minimum. And that's where people graduate to. As long as it makes me happy, I will do it. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. mm -hmm. Which is wrong. What are the sources of this trauma? Sources of this trauma, um, of course, there is a, um, there, we have injustices in our, in our society. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like now, uh, there's a child in prison. I was asking this child what happened, and uh, the child says I was uh, I was framed by by my stepmother. And there's so many cases of stepmother, stepdad, stepmother, stepdad. So simply, it's a broken oh, yeah. uh, family unit. Yeah. Uh, and then there is also corruption because you'll ask the child what happened, and they will say I went stealing because. I needed food. That is poverty. So that one is actually um, 
advanced by this person holding an office somewhere, mm -hmm. misappropriating uh, public uh, funds. funds. Yeah. And um, then you meet uh, another child, and uh, this child tells you, you know, uh, honestly, I don't know because uh, I live with my grandmother, and my parents just decided uh, I should be living with my grandmother, and my grandmother is also tired of me. Wow. Yeah, so what happens is that these children are acting out as a result of the pain they are going through. But yeah. you don't want to address the pain. We want to rectify behavior. And sometimes you also want to medicate behavior. Yeah. So, uh, and, and uh, sometimes it's just a dysfunctional society. Uh, because I remember there is this uh, patient, a, a young child who, uh, who came for psychotherapy in a public hospital. And the mother said, um, you need to make sure that he gets medicine. He said, no. No. So I asked the mother, where do you live? She told me, um, a, it's, a, it's actually near uh, a bus stop. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the building, there's, there are nightclubs. And what happens to such a child, ADHD? It's really interesting, <laughs> the instructions. But the question is, why would you have someone estab having such an establishment in in uh, residential yes. areas? It's simply because of greed, and it's actually an element of isolation. Right. So it is fear driving this person to to put up such a, an establishment in a residential area, because their definition of success is how much they get. So they will not think about the ripple effect. Yes. So they will get their profits today, but ten years down the line will still have a child who has mental illness yeah. as a result of profits. Yeah. Yeah. And meanwhile, they've also been paying bribes to county uh, officials absolutely. so that they can maintain those uh, facilities. Yeah, because we have bylaws. Yeah. So the question is, how did this person end up putting up such an establishment yeah. there? Yeah. So there's an entire chain in this whole ecosystem that supports the dysfunction, but all of it is dysfunctional, all the way up to the governorship or the senatorship or the presidency. Absolutely. Because no one is actually paying attention to what kind of society are we planning to harvest at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. It's more like, no, we're going to say Kenya is successful mm -hmm. because people are earning this much money mm -hmm. and 3,000 children more went to school this year even if it was by force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to say that now we are collecting more money in revenues even though they, they sent the revenue authority to arm twist everybody mm -hmm. and collect. Mm -hmm. So the whole ecosystem is actually causing fear to thrive and you know people to be injured who feel like they can't articulate you know their challenges so children are setting fire to schools but the reason for doing it is not even sorted out yeah it, it is it is uh it is not and, and you see uh what i tell people is that uh, we are so preoccupied by as in, our positions uh that we forget we live in a community mm. and uh if uh if if we can look within, then that means we will be able to address what is happening. Mm -hmm. And what happens with the, in our society is, uh, especially when working with young people, uh, you find that currently we have so many young people resisting in different countries. And sometimes we say uh, it is because uh, of unemployment. But even the ones who are employed, they are still reacting. Mm -hmm. So. Unemployment, it's not necessarily the main issue. Yeah. The main issue here is that we have a society that is dysfunctional. And the only way to make this society functional is to make sure that we address uh, collective trauma, individual trauma, bring a sense of healing. Uh, because if we, don't, if, if we don't do that, we'll just be bandaging uh, situations. Right. They're not dealing with, uh, uh, with the real with the real issues. Yeah. And I find that it's not just uh, the people who are uh, the, the middle class and all that. Uh, we have a sense of helplessness that makes us not value humanity because uh, when, uh, uh, let's say, uh, when someone is involved in an accident, mm -hmm. uh, you'll still find people stealing from, uh, from the, 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 the people who are the injured and even others stealing from the dead. Uh, so the question is, uh, what what is happening? Yeah. It's because um, we we have 
we are so we are isolated socially and we are also isolated internally. Yeah. Okay. And the worst is uh, actually the worst is internal isolation. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, by so doing, there is no connection between the brain, the heart, and your hands. Yeah. So there is such distortion. Uh, where what you are thinking and how your heart, your soul is, they are totally different things. Yeah. And then what your hands are uh, doing. Mm. So I tell people actually, uh, uh, internal isolation is worse than a civil con uh, conflict, civil war. Wow. Yeah. So this is why you then now try to help to fix foundational issues like parenting or identity. <coughs> or even working with institutions, public institutions, to try and help restore some kind of, I don't know, I guess it would be perspective and, and yeah. humanity. Mm -hmm. It is human, human dignity. Um, and uh, to restore human dignity, um, one, we must em embrace uh, uh, doing what is right, even when it is uncomfortable. Uh, we must embrace uh, justice and reconciliation. Uh, we must embrace that uh, uh, the core of a uh, child's development is giving that child love that they need. And love is not in things. Love is connecting with the soul of that child. And, uh, and, and uh, it's okay to make a child comfortable, um, but the most important thing is, is there human connection uh, in, in, that, uh, in that home, in that, so in that, in that society? Yeah. And uh, also ensuring that uh, we equip people uh, on, on what to do. Actually, one of the things I'm discouraging parents today is that when you see a young person, whether a girl or a boy, misbehaving, please don't call law enforcement. Intervene. Mm -hmm. Intervene. Try as much as you can to have a conversation with that, with that child. Because when you call law enforcement, they will come and do their work. Mm -hmm. And a child who is broken, the child will be broken even more. Right. And uh, I remember someone telling me that um, uh, there are some issues in the society, uh, or rather how a child behaves, that need uh, that will require a child being taken to, to a police station. I know, yes, breaking the law and all those things, those things happen, but why do we get there? The reason we have 85% of boys uh, and men uh, in prison compared to 15-14% of women in prison, it's simply because we are not engaging as a society. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the reason why we have uh, uh, women every day crying of oppression even at the work, mm -hmm. it's because we are not engaging as men. So for, for Braveheart, it's mainly to build a community and a society uh, that will help these young people uh, be responsible. Yeah. And 10 years from now, uh, we can actually have a, a connection in different African states mm -hmm. where men are speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. And it's a language driven by vision right. uh, and uh, a language driven by unity. And yesterday I was watching uh, uh, a documentary on, uh, on uh, South African uh, communities, uh, the Zulu and you know, all that and I realized the amount of wealth in our history mm -hmm. um, it's actually it's something that we need to to study yeah uh, because the kind of unity that these people had and then when you look at um, what actually broke the unity it's capitalism mm -hmm. <laughs> every time that community was defeated it's simply because of capitalism and every time uh, they defeated the enemy, uh, those who had come to invade, it's simply because they were functioning as human beings. Right. And, and today, like I have my friends who are pastoralists, and th these people are not really stressed. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they have human connection. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they are not addicted as we are uh, to, to profits and such things. And so I would say that. Uh, as, as Africa, uh, we need to, to create uh, a conversation mm -hmm. 
then also know how to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. And it's the other thing that we encourage boys to do. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's this boy who had been released from a juvenile center. And he was asking, uh, but since my records are wrong, is it will I ever get a job? Okay, somewhere. And my question to him was, uh, why do you think you need a job? And he said, to make money. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, to live a good life. What else? To live in a good neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And then what else? He said, you have so many questions. Can you just give me a solution? <laughs> and so I told him, actually, um, what you need is to function uh, as a human being. And all those things that you have mentioned are motivated by fear. So you ended up in prison because of resistance. You resisted something that you were not given a chance to express. Mm -hmm. So you ended up in, in prison. While in prison, you are in denial that this thing is not happening. And that's what actually uh, uh, elevated your stress mm -hmm. and depression levels, trying to manage the pain of rejection, mm -hmm. of shame and guilt in prison. And then when you live in prison, you have fear. So you still go back to where you are. So we need to address these three things. Yeah. And he said, uh, it's okay. So I asked him, so what do you want to do? He said, I want to learn more. I told him, just go back to school. Let's just, just do that. When that time comes where someone requires to see your records, yeah. then you will have a conversation around it. Yeah. yeah but uh, be present. Uh, and uh, what isolation also does, isolation makes you live in the past or live in the future. You are never present. Yeah. And that's why people don't connect. So you see why we had to talk to John Mills. It was absolutely imperative that you hear from the heart of someone who has actually stood up to pursue his mandate in repairing these breaches that exist in society. What it's like and what's going on behind the scenes that sometimes we're just not honest with ourselves about. So I just wanted to round up by saying this. Um, if you want to connect with John Mills, get in touch with us. We will put you in touch immediately. I feel like there are some people out there who are trying to figure out ways in which to roll out programs like he is. And he already has this written down. We've told you oftentimes it's not necessary to start from scratch. You can plug into people across the continent, find out what they're doing and how they're doing it. Get content like this that you can immediately begin to implement on the ground and start to do the work of transforming. Of course, you're going to adapt it to your own local context so that it is more relevant. But in terms of getting foundational tools in order for you to be able to build and rebuild and reconstruct society the way that we need to and the way that we need to do with the speed that we need to do it with, partnerships, interactions, relationships are necessary. Africa must once again become the connected um, vessel and tool that she needs to be in order for the hearts and the minds of men and women across the continent, young and old, to be able to be restored and revitalized so that we can become and continue to be the life-giving spirits that we are meant to be. Because that is our role. So thank you so much for watching today. Thank you for allowing us to have this time with you. We really appreciate it. Sure. Once again, if you need to reach him, let us know. We will connect you instantly. Because the work that Africa needs done, as you can hear from him, is foundational. And he has understood it, studied it, and worked it out, and is available to help empower you. It doesn't matter what country you're in. So thank you for your time. Think about the things that we have discussed here today. Watch the video again. Share it with people who you know need to hear it. Discuss it with friends and family alike. And let's just be honest with ourselves about what's really going on on the continent. So like, share, subscribe. Let us have your comments and feedback in the comment section below. And let's meet once again when we do this next time.